We were talking last week, we've been talking now, this is our third week, discussing specifically what the Bible has to say concerning the dead. And we are addressing the issue of hauntings and ghosts and anything related to that, you know. Uh, that would include so-called shadow people. That would include so-called poltergeist, you know. Uh, we covered all of that in the last couple of weeks. There are many different manifestations that basically all fall under the category of ghosts and haunting. And we're trying to address this. What does the Bible say concerning these things? Is it true or is it possible that the soul or the spirit of a departed individual remains on this earth wandering around trying to figure its way out and you know uh, and we know from the word of God thus far that no there is no room for the concept of ghosts the word of God declares it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment and uh, there is no biblical doctrine of purgatory as I talked last week, that was a Catholic moneymaker. It served its purpose well. The Catholic Church has built... Folks, you don't think the Catholic Church has got all these expensive edifices everywhere you go. Somehow, you've got to raise an awful lot of money to build these buildings. I remember a lady I met in Pennsylvania when I was there doing a work for the Lord many years ago. And... Uh, she was one of very few Catholic people in the entire town that I was in, in western Pennsylvania. And she bragged to me about uh, what a lovely church they had. It was all stone. It had taken them something like 15 years to build it. Because, listen to me now, Rome, the Vatican, does not contribute one nickel to any structure that is built. They don't contribute one penny. It all has to be raised by the local congregation. She said, oh, we sacrificed and we did all kinds of fundraisers. That's why they do all these fundraisers in order to pull money out of the community to help them build their edifices. But listen, once it's built, it's the property of the Vatican. A lot of people, I don't want to go into too much detail with this tonight, a lot of people don't realize every Catholic church you see is, is the equivalent to an embassy. You're on foreign soil when you go into a Catholic church. Because it's the property of another country. It's representative of another country. See, there's a reason why Catholicism is a political entity with a religious front, a religious facade. And uh, every structure you see. So here you've got their people working themselves to death for 15 years, pulling money out of the community by having all kinds of fundraisers and all kinds of things, just pulling all kinds of money out of the community to build these buildings that then become the property of the Vatican. Yeah. And it just contributes to the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And very seldom will you ever see a little wooden frame Catholic Church anywhere. That's mm -hmm. right. Oh no, right. They, they guilt their people to death. If you don't build yeah. God a grand edifice, then you don't love God enough. You know, you're not showing your yeah. worship and adoration. And after all, and, and I could go into all the details of their doctrine, but... You know, this building is where we offer the sacrifice of the host. Mm -hmm. And that little piece of bread that they put inside a, a big jeweled fixture, which is called a monstrous, mind you. That's why when people say, my, that was a monstrous thing, you know. That, that's a term coming from the Roman church. Yeah. And uh, that is where they place the bread, uh, one piece of the bread. And then it is worshipped as though it were Christ. Because according to them, that piece of bread is the host, Jesus. The bread becomes the actual, literal body of Christ. 
and therefore Christ is present according to Catholic teaching uh, by reason of the bread and the wine. We know as believers uh, in the truth that Christ is present by reason of the Holy Ghost, Amen. which is none other than the Spirit of Himself. Amen. The Word of God declaring, Now that Spirit is the Lord. Amen. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. Amen. So, I say all that to say, purgatory was a wonderful money-making scheme. It has worked well for centuries. It continues to work well. However, in truth, there is no biblical support whatsoever for the concept of purgatory. So, you cannot even biblically twist the concept of purgatory to justify ghosts. Right. All right? So, let's move on now. What else does the Word of God say concerning the dead? John 5.25 declares, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So, they're not, they're not floating around somewhere living yet, in, you know, in some spiritual existence in this world. When the Word of God speaks of them living in this sense, it is literally speaking of within this existence. Okay? They're, not, they're not part of this existence. Once you die, it is not that your conscience, uh, consciousness goes away. You're still conscious. You're still, in effect, alive, I guess you might say in some ways. But you're no longer part of the land of the living. You're no longer part of this physical stage. Okay, And uh, in Ephesians 4, 8 and 10, Paul wrote, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same that also, also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Now, I've talked in great detail in times past concerning uh, the thief on the cross. Mm -hmm. One of the most common arguments that is used to uh, try to discount the doctrine of the necessity of water baptism mm -hmm. is the argument, well, the thief on the cross was saved. Right. The thief on the right. cross was not saved. Yeah. That it, it, you have got to really twist and pervert, and it cracks me up because there will be people out there that will watch what I'm saying right now that will argue me, Baptists, mm -hmm. fundamentalists, they will argue with me tooth and toenail about what I'm about to say. They don't even believe their own doctrine. They don't even believe their own teaching. Their, their doctrine is so foul and so screwed up. Honey, when you've got to contradict yourself, to establish a teaching, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Jesus right. Christ was on the cross. He had not died. No one could make heaven without Jesus. Amen. That's right. No one could make heaven without the Lord's death, right. His burial, and His resurrection. Amen. The right. Apostle Paul said, If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God hath raised Him from the dead. That's right, amen. That's what is required for salvation. Well, you can confess the Lord all you want to. He hadn't died. He had not risen. Therefore, it was impossible for full salvation to be imparted to the thief on the cross. That's right, amen. But when you do a little bit of study, you find out that really the, the tale on the, of the thief on the cross and the Lord's conversation with him is really self-explanatory. You don't even need to go into all this doctrinal mumbo-jumbo. The truth of the matter is the Lord did not say, Today thou shalt be with me in heaven. Right. Amen. That's right. He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Yes. Paradise Amen. in the context of his time 
was a term that was used to describe a place that is often referred to as Abraham's bosom. Amen. It is the same location that Lazarus yep. went to, yep. mm -hmm. and the rich man went to hell, and Ra Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. Amen. And there was a great gulf fixed between where Lazarus was and where the rich man was in torment. Now, if you look at the word that is used in the Greek for, for paradise, it literally translates a garden. But the Jewish people believed it to be a holding place. It is where the righteous Jews who are awaiting Messiah would go until Messiah arrived. Yes, Paul states in Ephesians 4, 8, and 10 that Jesus, following his death, descended first yep. into paradise where the Jews who were looking for Messiah to come were waiting. The Word of God said He preached unto the spirits there. Mm -hmm. And it specifically uses the word spirits. Yes. Mm -hmm. When you look at uh, that passage, you'll see, and I, I believe I have it coming up here in a minute, uh, but you'll see the Word of God said, but He descended first and He preached unto the spirits that were in hell. Mm -hmm. Alright? Paradise was a partitioned, as it were, portion of hell. Mm -hmm. Like I said before, if, if you're in a beautiful, wonderful hospital, and the environment's wonderful, and they have pool tables, and they have ping pong tables, and they have dark boards, and they have video games, but you're locked in there and you cannot leave. Mm -hmm. yeah. You do not have the freedom to come and go as you please. That's right. yep. Honey, that's a difficult environment to live in. That is yeah. a difficult place to be. Especially if your loved ones can't come in and go as they please either. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. If you are locked away, I don't care if you're locked away in Club Med for eternity. And you will never be able to be in the presence of God. You will never be able to be in the presence of your loved ones. You'll never know those that you knew in life. You'll be separated from them forever. And you will be reminded over and over and over and over again that you were deceived. That you refused to believe and obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the devil is going to literally entertain himself by reminding the spirits there, you were deceived. We got you. Yeah, that's right. And you fool. You would not listen. You would not listen. You heard it preached, but you, you would not listen. And they are going to remind. And the Word of God said they're in torments. That is part of the torment. Yeah. Okay? So... The spirits that were then in paradise, the Word of God tells us in Ephesians that the Lord led captivity captive. When He ascended, when did He ascend back to heaven? Well, let me ask this question. Well, that's right. Did He ascend during the three days He was buried? No. 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 What did he say to Mary? Said, Don't touch me. Right. I have not yet ascended. Right. Yep. That's right. So, my foolish friend, who doesn't want to believe the Word of God, even though you claim to be a fundamentalist and you're absolutely committed to the absolute authority of Scripture, if Jesus didn't go to heaven for three days, at least, how in the world did he meet the thief in heaven? Amen. Mm. He wasn't going to heaven. Amen. Paul said he went first. Uh -huh. He that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first That's right. Amen. into the lower parts of the earth. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Amen. So, why would the Lord say, today thou shalt be with me in heaven, but he's not going to heaven? Yeah. Right. All right? So get your doctrine straight. Get your doctrine right. Get the truth in your soul. Without Jesus rising from the dead, 
Nobody's going to be saved without the Lord rising from the dead. Amen. So right. the notion that the thief on the cross was saved is foolishness. The thief on the cross established to the Lord that his heart was right. Yes, amen. And therefore, he would meet him in that holding place yes, where the Jews who were looking for Messiah amen. were waiting. Uh -huh. Where John the Baptist yes, had already arrived Ooh. with his head under his arm, yeah. declaring, yeah. folks, Man. he's up there, Say he's that. up there now, I'm telling you, Ooh. he'll be here any yeah. day now. Man. Mm -hmm. wow. And John was there in that holding place yes. with the rest Man. of his Jewish brethren Man. as the corridors of hell, he come no more. Ooh, yes, Whoa, glory. Oh, glory. Began to hear the echo oh, of the Jesus. footsteps Amen. of the master. Glory to God. Coming Ooh. down the alleyways and coming down oh, through God. the darkness. Amen. And I hear John say, Amen. I believe that's him Amen. now. Hallelujah Amen. to God. He called me Hallelujah. to in the spirit of Elijah Ooh. to be the forerunner, Amen. to be the declarer. I declared him to the living, and now I declare him to the dead. Hallelujah to God. That's why John had to go home before the Lord died. Oh, Lord, amen. Because he was going to fulfill his purpose not only yes. in life, but also in death. Amen. Because why? Because God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Amen. They were still Ooh. conscious. They were still yes. existent. Amen. They were just not existent in this plane. Wow. If you had ghosts running around, brother, yes. Amen. then you'd have had people who missed the ascension. Yep. Yep. When the Lord led captivity captive, and he brought those that were captive, yep. he took them and he led them to glory. Yes, mm -hmm. Lord, amen. You'd have had people who missed amen. that if their ghosts were floating around haunting Aunt Mary and Uncle Joe. Uh, okay? Right. So the only time we see any consciousness is either in heaven yes. or in hell. Amen. Before the Lord's resurrection, it's either in hell or it's in paradise or Abraham's bosom. Right. Okay? Amen. We don't see any mention of anybody anywhere in between. Right. Okay? Yes, amen. There's no mention of any existence. Nowhere do we see the Word of God talking about somebody kind of floating around in the middle. Right, amen. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8, Paul writes, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Yes. For we walk by faith, not by sight, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present yes, with the Lord. Amen. So concerning believers, Paul said, once your soul leaves this body, it is in the presence of God. My grandma ain't running around watching me brush my teeth and take showers. She is shouting around the throne of glory. She is worshiping the Almighty. She's given God the glory. She is without pain. She is without disease. She will never know death. She will never be parted from a loved one again. The only thing she'll ever know from this day forward are the joys of the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. There is no scripture that speaks of any in-between, any lingering right. of the human soul or the human spirit. Now here you have an illustration back in the 1920s, 1930s of a seance. Oh. Very common. The spiritualist movement had a major uh, revival, as it were, uh, back in the early part of this last century. And uh, many people engaged in seances. It was found most often that most of your mediums and your so-called, you know, uh, those that could communicate with the dead were just flat-out frauds. Yeah. 
and uh, Houdini, the famous uh, magician, he actually went about because he wanted desperately to believe that you could communicate with the dead. And he wanted to find a medium who was real. But being a master of trickery and knowing how you go about fooling people, he would go to these seances and he would observe and then he would expose the mediums. And they say that he exposed every medium he came into contact with. He was able to, to uh, pull back the curtain, as it were, and reveal exactly how they did every single thing they did. You would not believe some of the tomfoolery these people would engage in. Some of these women would slip their, their foot out of a shoe and use their toes to pull on a string that would ring a bell or, you know, that would yeah. make the table robble or something, you know. And they had all these gimmicks and all these tricks they would use. And Houdini was able to figure out every single one of them. And he was so disgusted and despondent because he literally wanted to believe. He loved his mother dearly. He wanted to communicate with his mother after she died. And he wanted desperately to believe that you could communicate with the dead. So he was looking for a real medium mm -hmm. and he could not find one now what does the word of God say concerning communication with the dead Deuteronomy 18 9 through 14 the Lord is speaking to Moses concerning the nation of Israel the Jewish people as they come into the promised land and he gives this command when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee Thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. <clears throat> Necromancers, one that attempts to communicate with the dead. Right. Yeah. Now, I just want to point something out to you because I, a lot of people don't know this. The term that is used here, wizard, now you would almost think that a witch or a male witch, a warlock, would be the same as a wizard. No. What a wizard was, in this context in biblical times, were individuals who used substances, mind-altering substances, in order to communicate with spirits. And in order to see, they thought that using uh, these drugs or these substances gave them an insight into the spirit world. There are people who have used LSD, who have used acid, you know, who have used cocaine and various other drugs, and all of a sudden they're seeing demons. And they're seeing things that scare the life out of them. I got a call from a man just the other day. He sent me a message on Facebook and he said, Pastor, can you please call me as soon as you can? He said, I need you to call me. He's in Georgia. I called him right away. And I, I didn't know what was wrong. And I said, what's wrong, brother? He said, he was doing something at the house. I won't go into details. It did not have anything to do with drugs or anything like that. But anyway, he said, all of a sudden, three demons appeared to me. And I knew they were demons from the second they appeared. He said, one of them looked like Lucifer himself. And that was scary enough. He said, but one of them looked like one of the most beautiful men you've ever laid your eyes on. He said, now they all three appeared to him simultaneously. And he said, now here you've got one that looks like the devil, one that looks like an absolutely gorgeous male. Mm -hmm. He said, and the other looked like a kind of a classic imp, you know, oh. devilish character. Yeah. He said, brother, it scared the life out of me. And I didn't know what to do, so I thought I'd call you and ask you if you could give me some counsel. <laughs> so I prayed with him over the phone. And I told him, I said, brother, somewhere along the line, you've opened a door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
These things don't just show up to be showing up. You, you must have opened the door. So I talked to him and I was trying to feel around and help him see if he could identify where a door was open. So I instructed him. I said, you need to let the devil know. Devil, whatever door I've opened, I'm shutting. I don't want you in my home. I don't want you in my life. I don't want you in my vision. I don't want you anywhere near me. And so everything went well. Now, people who use mind-altering drugs, this can include alcohol. You do not realize when you use pot. Oh, pot's harmless. No. It alters your consciousness. It alters your thinking. It alters your mind. You lose control. There is a reason why the Word of God teaches that one of the fruits of the Spirit is meekness, which is self-control. A believer ought to be in control of themselves at all times. Nothing, I don't care if it's drinking coffee, nothing should ever control you. That's right, amen. Nothing. You should always be in control at all times. This is why we have to abstain from those things which uh, possibly lead to addiction. Right. Yep. All right? You do not use substances that alter your state of mind. Amen. Because when you do that, you're opening the door. Right. There are people that have used pot, that have used drugs. We had a young man that came for deliverance ministry here to the church. Well, not here, but when we were over on Inwood. And uh, his mother was saying, you know, he was hanging with a crowd and they were doing a lot of drinking and all this sort of thing. That's all it takes. Yes, amen. See, people don't realize when you start, that's wizardry. That's right. That's wizardry. Especially when you, when you go into it with the thought process. And during the 1960s, let me tell you, there were a lot of people who literally went around saying that LSD... Opens you up, man. It like yeah. it's a spiritual experience, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's really groovy, man. You know, yeah. you don't know, man. It just really, you know. Oh, I mean, it just opens your mind up. Yeah, it also opens your spirit up. That's right, amen. And it opens you up to things you may not want to be open to. So that's when you read the word wizard. That's what it's talking about. People who use a lot of your Native Americans. They use substances right. claiming that it gives them insight into the spirit world. You see? That's wizardry. Yeah. So if you go and you employ a Native American shaman, yeah. That's right. you're potentially inviting a wizard yeah. into your home. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, they don't call themselves wizards. But from a biblical standpoint, that's what you're dealing with. So when old Amy... Amy, what's her mug? Allen on TV and her little uh, medium self tells people what you need to do is go hi, go find you a shaman to come in and do this and so. Watch out, folks. Wrong answer. That's right. Wrong yeah. answer. Wrong yeah. answer. You don't want to do that. Okay. So he said, For all these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee, or instructed thee, or allowed thee, or permitted thee to do so. Exodus 22, 18, the word of God declares, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Oh. Now I want to say that that's how serious witchcraft mm -hmm. was viewed by God. Wow. There are people who are calling for gays and lesbians to be killed, to be put to death. Because after all, the Word of God says. Well, the Word of God also says that an adulterer that's caught in the act should be put to death. Both the man and the woman. Yeah. Uh, I don't see anybody calling for that because old Newt Gingrich and old you know, Rush Limbaugh, boy, I'll tell you, the Republican Party would be empty tomorrow. Yeah. You know, if they started killing off all the adulterers. Uh, 
It's so funny how we pick and choose what part of Amen. Scripture we Amen. want to adhere to. But, uh, let me change mics real quick here. I'm going to have to figure that out. All right. So, um, by no means are we suggesting or saying in the New Testament era that witches ought to be put to death. I would not, you'll never hear me call for witches to be put to death. Nope. I'm going to tell you a little secret. We got people who want to believe that America was formed by God Himself, that the Lord come down from heaven and wrote the Constitution and handed it to Thomas Jefferson, who in turn handed it to Washington. Garbage. I, I, I hate to speak so plain and so blunt. It's garbage. This foolishness of having an American flag and a Christian flag side by side in the house of God is idolatry. Amen. Amen. You can call it patriotism all you want to. It's idolatry. Don't you dare bring your nationalism into the house of God. Amen. It has no place there. Amen. Amen. I've got news for you where patriotism is concerned. Uh, there are people who are patriotic in China. Mm -hmm. And they wholeheartedly believe in the communist system. That's mm -hmm. right. They have every right to be. Mm -hmm. It's their country. If, that, if they believe in that system and if they support, I don't prefer it. I don't want that system. But if they have it and they like it and they think it works for them, then hey, God bless them. They have every right to be patriotic. See, we act like Americans are the only people on the planet who have a right to be patriotic. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. There's not a country on this planet that the people don't deserve the right to be patriotic concerning their own nation. That's right, amen. Okay? The concept of God established America to do all these great things. I'm going to tell you, before this whole thing is said and done, you're going to find out that God did not establish America for nothing. That's right, That's right. amen. I'm going to tell it plain tonight. You're going to find out the devil was very much involved. Amen. Our, our national capital has more idolatry in it yes. than any yes. capital in the entire world. That's mm -hmm. right. You will find more idols in our national capital. That's I'm right. not talking about the Lincoln Monument, the Jefferson Monument. Right. I am talking about actual statues and uh, reliefs and artwork of deities That's going right. back to ancient Rome, going back That's to right. ancient Greece. Amen. Atop our very capital building, there is a female deity. They've renamed her. It's yes, it's 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 freedom. They call her freedom, Lady Freedom. Mm -hmm. It is a deity that literally, you know what it, you know what she represents in, in ancient times, deceit. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, you wrote deception. That. Yes, that's right. Lies. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm gonna tell you something. Boy, it was aptly placed. Wait till you find out what's been going on in our capital for 200 and some odd years. That's right, amen. When George Washington laid the cornerstone of the U.S. Capitol building, mm -hmm. he wore Masonic regalia. Mm -hmm. He was wearing a full Masonic garb. He was not representing Christianity. He was not right. representing Christ. He was representing the Masons, which are anything but Christian. Amen. Okay? So, folks, don't fool yourselves. There is a lot more going on in our world than you'll ever dream. You say, why doesn't this church have a flag in it? Well, they ought to have an American flag. Aren't they a patriot? I'm a very patriotic person. Mm -hmm. And I'm all for having the flag where the flag belongs. Amen. Amen. I don't have a problem with flags, not a bit. I don't have one ounce of trouble with the American flag. I have a problem with it in the house of God. Yes, yep. amen. You don't amen. bring anything into the house of God that competes for people's affections, that competes for their That's attention. Right. Nothing. Our God is a jealous God. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay, so, by no means am I going to get up here and say, oh, witches need to die. No. If we're going to live in America, and if we're going to claim to believe in freedom of religion, then we have got to suspend whatever convictions we have concerning, you know, our specific faith yep. and allow others to practice whatever they're going to practice. That's right. That's right. That's right. This notion that America was built on Judeo-Christian, that's a bunch of crock. Yep. 
Because I'm going to tell you something right now. Had that been so, freedom of religion would not have been in the Bill of Rights. That's right. That's right. That's right. It contradicts Jewish teaching, and it contradicts Christian teaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we were truly a so-called Christian nation, there would have been no room for any other religion outside of Christianity. And so the fact that our founding fathers wrote a constitution and a bill of rights that called for the free expression and practice of any religion, of any choice, that clearly, clearly indicates that it was not built on biblical principles. So you can twist and pervert all you want to, but the truth is out there. Right. All right? So, I'm an American. As an American, I believe you can practice whatever religion you want to practice. That's right. As a Christian, I believe you're going to miss heaven if you have not heard and obeyed the gospel of the Amen. Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Yes, Amen. I have no problem. I cannot argue with, with someone else having the freedom to practice their religion because the minute I try to stop them, I'll be next. Yes, That's right. amen. And this is what's going to happen because the religious right has been trying to dictate which religions are acceptable, which practices right. are acceptable, yeah. you know, right. which beliefs are acceptable, uh, whether you can't sacrifice animals. And blah, blah. What about the Jewish people? What are you going to do about that? When the temple's rebuilt, honey, they'll be sacrificing again. Mm -hmm. You better know it. Mm -hmm. Of course, it'll be in Israel, so, you know, it's not like American law will affect it. But the point I'm trying to make is, you know, there are some religions, they believe in sacrificing animals. Mm -hmm. I'll be frank and honest with you. I, I may abhor that religion. But again, if you're going to if you're gonna embrace what America teaches, right. they ought to be free to do that. That's right. Mormonism embraced polygamy. Mm -hmm. They ought to be free to. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm being That's honest. Right. I'm being frank. They ought That's to be right. free. I'm going to tell you something right now. If we'd stop trying to force people into our mold and force people to do things the way we... There's an old saying, give a thief enough rope and he'll hang himself. Yeah. That's right. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. Mormonism probably would have fizzed out by now if we'd have let them practice their religion the way they were practicing it in the times of Joseph Smith. Yeah and Brigham Young. Mm -hmm. If we'd have let them keep going down the path they were going, honey, they'd have destroyed themselves. Because a lot of people who get into this polygamous stuff wind up realizing, dear God, what a mess this is. I want out of this, you know. Yes, and But no, we've, we've got to dictate how, what people are able... Yeah, we believe in freedom of religion, except you can't practice it. Except you can't do that. Now we got people having a fit over gay marriage. And my attitude is this. Listen, if there are churches that say, hey, we're willing to perform same-sex ceremonies, we're willing to sanction same-sex unions, they ought to have the right to Amen. do that. That's right. Amen. Whether you like it or not, this That's is America. Right. We're supposed to have freedom of religion. That's right. Amen. We're supposed to be free to practice our religion. And, and this whole notion, oh, we're built on Judeo-Christian, that is such a crock of nonsense. That is so contrary to history and the truth. And yet there are millions of people in this country, fundamentalists especially, that want to believe a lie, and they just go crazy believing this foolishness. And it is a lie. It is sheer foolishness. Go to Washington, D.C. Everywhere you turn your head, you're looking at a deity. Yeah. And not a one of them is Jesus. That's right. That's right. Amen. The only thing they have that even comes close to representing Judeo-Christian are uh, images of the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet, they have a personal face on all these other deities. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yep. You don't see one cross. Mm -hmm. You don't see one Star of David. But you see Zeus. Mm -hmm. You see Jupiter. You see all these deities from ancient times? Isn't that funny? But we're a Judeo-Christian nation, brother. Mm -hmm. We've got Washington Monument built by who? The Masons. Mm -hmm. In honor of George Washington. Mm -hmm. And here it is in the form of an obelisk, which is an ancient symbol going all the way back to Babylon. Representative, it's a phallic representation. Mm -hmm. 
going back to the worship of the male genitals, to be yeah. frank. Mm -hmm. And it stands in the right smack dab in the middle of our capital city. Yeah. Folks, I'm telling you, we, we got to be careful. So, I said all that to say, I don't want people, just because I'm reading this today, I don't want people, oh, they're calling for the death of witches. No, witches can do whatever they want to do. In the end, honey, if you're not saved, you're going to be lost. Mm -hmm. That's right. You can do whatever you want to do. I have no problem. You can practice whatever you want to practice. I am so not afraid of witches, it's not even funny. Amen. That's right. I've got the Holy Ghost. I've got the authority Amen. of Jesus' name. I've got the power Amen. of God behind me. No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. Amen. I'm not the least bit worried about it. Amen. That's right. Amen. All right. Saul and the witch of Endor is a famous story that yes. we read about in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel right. chapter 28. 5 through 14, and when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, or the number of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. You remember what we said concerning familiar spirits. That means you work with a spirit. There's a spirit that cooperates with you, helps you to know things that supposedly, you know, this particular spirit is aware of future things to come and all. And, and they're, they're exposing you to knowledge you would not otherwise have. All right, so there is a, a woman with a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. So in other words, he took off his kingly garments. Because obviously if he walked in dressed as the king, <laughs> she would immediately know who he was. And he put on garments to disguise himself. And he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land, Wherefore then layest thou a snare for me to cause me to die? And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. We know from reading the story further that Samuel rebuked Saul. Yeah said, why have you called me up? What have you done? Why have you done this thing? And uh, Samuel was not floating around the room. He was not haunting Saul, watching Saul change and take baths and make love to his many wives. And you know, this is not a story about a ghost. <coughs> See, now there are people that will try to twist and pervert again. No. The Word of God said, be absent from bodies, be present with the Lord. Prior to the Lord's resurrection, they were in where? They were in paradise. We know paradise wasn't heaven because Saul, uh, excuse me, Samuel said, 
Why have you called me uh, up? up. Mm -hmm. That's right. You brought me forth. You brought me up. So he's clearly indicating I was below. Right. Okay. He then goes on. Uh, Paul is uh, Saul is wanting to confer with his old confidant, with this man of God that for many years was, you know, the the go-between between he and the Lord. And he this is where he would get a word from the Lord through Samuel. And he wanted to be like me, wanting to talk to Brother Gillum. Oh, Lord, yeah. And go into a medium or something to call up Brother Gillum, you know. And uh, but nowhere in this story is it suggested that Samuel was a ghost. In other words, nowhere in this is it even alluded to that Samuel was earthbound in any way, shape, size, or form. That's right. No, Amen. he was elsewhere. That's right. And in this instance, God allowed the actual man Samuel mm -hmm. to appear to Saul. Normally, when you're dealing with a familiar spirit, that familiar spirit will take on the identity of whoever right. you're wanting to talk to. That's right. And then you've got this psychic standing there thinking they're seeing somebody, you know, so then they'll describe the person. Now notice in this description what she said that Samuel was wearing. A mantle. That's all. A mantle, a robe. Mm -hmm. It says, then Paul, uh, Saul, I keep wanting to say Paul. I'm thinking of New Testament Saul. And then Saul, quote, discerned that it was Samuel. Uh -huh. Ghosts are always running around, brother, in clothes they wore in life. Yeah, that's right. They're always carrying guns they used to carry. They've got... <laughs> Knives they used to carry. They've got axes they killed people with in their hands. They've got lanterns lit that they used to light uh, to, to signal the oncoming train. The Word of God said we take nothing into this life. We'll take nothing That's out. right. Amen. The Word of God says that one day God is going to put upon us a robe of righteousness. That's right. Samuel was all he was wearing was a robe. When angels appear to people, they appear in a robe. Yeah. People that have seen angels say, and I saw a man in a robe. Mm -hmm. Great, big, tall, handsome, rugged looking guy appeared in a robe. And you know it was an angel. I'm going to tell you a little secret, my friend. If your little ghost was a real person, they would not be wearing clothes they wore in this life. That's right, That's right. amen. That contradicts the word of God. That's right. For it is certain I brought nothing into this life, and it is certain I'll take nothing out. That's right. You don't take anything with you out of this life. That's the Word of God. Amen. Uh -huh. So the very fact that they appear in clothing, in garments, with props mm -hmm. from this life, that tells you right there you're being deceived. That's right. The, the clothing and the props and the appearance are designed to make you believe it's that certain individual. That's the whole purpose of all that prop and all that uh, drama, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. So try to make you believe you're seeing a person from a certain era, from a certain time, you know, so on and so forth. Yep. Okay, now, it, I mean, it makes me laugh, you know, the ghost, of course, wears the hairstyle she wore in life. Well, I guess in death she goes to the same hairstylist. <laughs> and it's probably a different style than what she's wearing. I mean, honestly, you know, folks just don't, they don't use their head at all. Uh -huh. It's like, now in life, you'd have to go to the salon and get your hair done, or even the holiness ladies. They have to go to some woman in the church, or they have to go to somebody to get their hair done all fancy. But now they're dead a hundred years, and they still appear with that lovely coiffed hair. <laughs> Well, who does it on the other side? Uh -huh. They must have an angel. <laughs> My name is Eduardo. <laughs> I do hair. Hello! <laughs> All right, amen. So, in this story, a lot of times your spiritualists will try to use this as an example of communication with the dead. 
This was not permitted. This woman, by law, was supposed to die because of her practice. That's right. In this instance, she was not dealing with her familiar, and she knew immediately That's right. that it was not her familiar. And this is when she knew, aha, if the real Samuel is appearing, yep. he would only appear for one man. That's right. Mm -hmm. This must be Saul. That's right. And she turns around and says, you deceived me. Why did you deceive me? Why did you fool me this way? Yes. See, yeah. she was able to put two and two together based upon the fact, wait a minute, I'm not dealing with my familiar. All of a sudden, I'm seeing God's ascending. The term God's here is demons. She's seeing spirits. Says, I'm seeing demons, and in the midst of this is this man. What does he look like? What's he wearing? Because after all, we identify people by their clothing. I had a vision one time, and I'm not one that had visions. I've, I've told you this story before, and I won't tell you the whole thing again. But uh, I was praying one night in my house. Matter of fact, that brick house I pointed out when we went out to First Monday the other day. And I was in that very house, and I was down on my knees praying. And all of a sudden, it was like God literally put a movie screen down in front of my face. And I saw... A young man laying on the road. I saw a tractor trailer truck parked very close nearby. I saw a car over here and I saw a bike. The young man, I looked down at the young man and I could not discern his face. I couldn't discern, you know, what he looked like or who it was. But the only thing I could see on him that was clear was his hand. And his hand looked just like my brother Dallas's hand. Because my brother Dallas and I both have had that terrible habit of nibbling on our nails. I've done it my whole life. Uh, growing up in the environment I grew up in, I, that was a nervous habit I picked up. And I still do it when I'm bored, when I'm hungry, when I'm, you know, I, I, and I, my hands look terrible. But if anybody that knows me, if you know what my hands look like, I could be burned to a crisp as long as my hand's available, you'd know what was me. Yeah. Because my hands are very distinctive to look at. Well, when I saw this boy and I saw his hands, immediately I thought it was my brother. To make a long story short, I told you before, a young man got hit that very weekend by a car. He tried to go behind a tractor trailer truck that had come up the road and passed him. And then he tried to cross the road behind the tractor trailer truck, not realizing a car was coming the opposite way. The car hitting. Well, that Sunday, in Sunday school, I heard about this young man who had been hit, and I knew. I said, "God, that's who you showed me." And uh, because when I, I literally was so nervous for my brother, so concerned for my brother, that I went to my mother's house. This was like 12:30, 1 o'clock in the morning, and I knocked on my brother's window and I said, "Honey, please." It was raining. I said, please open the doors. I've got to pray with you. That's why I say Dallas has experienced so many things. Yeah, I know. I said, I've got to pray with you. And I began to pray for him. And the Lord spoke to me just as clear as the day. And he said, it's not him. Yeah. He said, but I want you to pray as though it were. Oh, See, the Lord knew how much I would pray for my brother, you know. <laughs> Obviously, I would pray like a house on fire. Yeah. He said, it's not your brother, but I want you to pray for him like it was your brother. And then it was that very Sunday. This happened to me like on Friday night. The boy got hit on Saturday. Yeah. I didn't hear about it. I didn't know about it until Sunday morning in Sunday school. I went to the hospital to see the boy. And when I got to the hospital and I picked up his little hand, his hand looked just like my brother's hand. Yeah. I, it could have. They could have had the same hands. They both had that. The, the nails were just the same way. They looked so much alike. That's why Jesus said when he rose from the dead, Behold my hands Ooh, yes, and my amen. feet. Mm -hmm. Had nothing to do with nail scars. Mm -hmm. It had to do with identity. Oh, you want to be certain? Ooh, Glory. 
Ooh. 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 Amen. You want to be certain it's me? Look at my hands. Yes. Look at my feet. Amen. You got to remember, this is at a time when culture called for a good host washing his guests' feet. That's right. That's right. Amen. That's right. This was at a time when a good host would offer a guest a, what we used to call anyway, a dry sink. You know, you'd bring them a little uh, bowl of water, a little basin of water, and a little pitcher so they could wash their hands mm -hmm. as they first yeah. entered your home. If there was any part of anybody that you would look at and see, it would be their hands and their feet. That's right. If there was any way the apostles could be absolutely certain this was Jesus. And not just somebody else saying, I'm the risen Christ. Oh, but Lord, your appearance has changed so. Yeah. Yes, but it's still me. He said, behold my hands. Behold my feet. So take, a, take a closer inspection and you'll see it's me. You follow what I'm saying? So, interesting that ghosts use clothing and props. They don't, don't use the identifiers that we use, which are Things that are unchanging, things that are constants, things that are absolutes. Yep. Yep. Hands yep. and feet. Your hands and feet, in effect, are like a, 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 a fingerprint. Mm -hmm. They're that unique to you. That's right. Anybody knows your hands? You know, there are parents who've had to go identify a body. Yeah. They go to the morgue and the uh, mortician or, or the... Uh, Medical examiner says, you know, now they were awful tore up. You're not going to be able to identify them by reason of their face. You're going to have to identify the body by other means. Yep. If that's your son or that's your daughter, show me their hands. Yes, amen. Show me their feet. Yep. I'll tell you if that's my kid or not. Yep. It's all I need to see. My brother Michael, I can tell you right now. I could, I could tell if, if, if I could not lay eyes on my brother's face, I could tell you it was him by reason of his hands, by reason of his feet. You follow what I'm telling you? Yes, amen. All right? I can, and, and I'm not trying to be vulgar. I'm not trying to be... But honestly, private sectors would mean nothing to me. I don't know what my brother looks like. I don't run around looking at my brother naked. Yes. Yeah. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes, amen. The most visible part of your body is your hands. In modern times, in biblical times, the most visible part of your body were both your hands and feet. Right. Because they didn't wear enclosed shoes like we do. They wore sandals. Right. They wore robes that went at least down to their, their men would wear robes that went down to about mid-calf. And then some of them went longer. A lot of people think in biblical times, everybody, all the men wore robes down to their feet, to their ankles. That is not so. Not so. Look at look at history books. Look at the garments worn by the Romans. Yeah, that's right. yeah. The men wore robes that went down about mid calf, roughly. Mm -hmm. You know, and it would look like almost like what we would call a smoking jacket. You know, length. All right. So anyway, uh, but here you have Saul judging by the garment, right. uh -huh. and yet all he's wearing is a robe. That's all he's got on is a rope. All right. And I told you when the Lord allowed me in a dream to see my grandmother after she had died. And I do not believe and I am not saying my grandmother appeared to me. Right. Amen. I believe God allowed a divine drama to play out for, for me, for my benefit. And, uh, and I told you my grandmother did not look like she looked when she passed. She was younger. She was healthier. She was prettier. I can't even tell you what she was wearing. Couldn't even tell you. I, 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 it, it, just, it didn't even come into my thinking. I just knew it was her. 
the, I, wasn't, I didn't have to identify her by her clothing. I knew it was her. Her face, her hands, I knew it was her. My little grandmother, when she died, she had very bad arthritis, and her little knuckles were all, every one of her knuckles had little bumps on them, you know, they go not real bad. My, my, my poor great-grandmother. And the dumb funeral home hammered her hands out, literally, so that her fingers were flat like this. I never saw my grandmother's hands like that in my life. I never yeah. saw my great-grandmother having her fingers flat like that. Yeah. I thought to myself, what a stupid funeral director. Mm. We, you know, her little knotted up hands, that was just part of her identity. Right. Yeah. And to, to, to flatten her fingers out the way he did was horrible. You know, it was horrific for us to even look at that. And, uh, you know, when my grandfather lay in his casket, his face didn't look very good. It, 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 it. He always had a big nose, you know. My grandfather, had, of course, would look at me talking. He had a big old nose. Well, in, in death, it kind of shrunk up and, you know, and his little, it looked just like a little skinny nose on his oh. face. And he didn't look like himself, to be honest. He really didn't. And, uh, but his hands. I look at those hands and I knew it was Grandpa. It didn't matter what his face looked like, I knew it was Grandpa. Isn't it funny that in death, his face changed, literally? His, his nose, literally, I can't even explain it. It was almost like he had plastic surgery. His, his whole nose just changed. And yet people see ghosts and they look like they always looked. Oh, but they're wearing, brother, they're wearing the stuff that they were wearing when they died. They still got bloody garments on from when they were murdered. Really? In their casket, did they look like themselves, but all bloody up? Or did features change when the body fluids were drained and they were embalmed and what have you? Do you follow what I'm saying? But, and yet these spirits use all these props, including clothing and what have you, in order to establish an identity. And yet when my grandmother appeared to me in that dream, I, clothing, I didn't even, clothing, what she was wearing didn't even matter. It, it never even crossed my mind to even look at her clothing. In my dream, I saw my grandma, she said, Chucky, come here. And I just knew it was grandma. And I knew and I and I was tickled out of my mind. And you know, and I couldn't even tell you what she was wearing. I can tell you she was not wearing any of the dresses that I knew her to wear in life. Because if she hadn't been, I would be able to tell you what she was wearing. <laughs> I'd be able to tell you, you know, she was wearing a house dress she always wore. She wasn't. I don't know what she was wearing, but it wasn't anything she wore in this life. Right. But I knew it was grandma. All right. Got a picture here that's depicting what is often referred to as shadow people. You know, the Bible says that evil deeds are done in darkness. And that they're done in the shadows. Evil is manifested in shadows mm -hmm. because shadows are representative of darkness. And it's interesting that a lot of times when they even catch these images on uh, film, they can be in a dark room. Mm -hmm. And yet the shadow figure is darker than the darkness of the room. So what, whatever little bit of light is in that room, that shadow image is even darker. It's, it's almost like it literally just sucks the light yeah. right out of that space that that image appears. Mm -hmm. Honey, that is demonic. Amen. That is evil. That's that is right. not some dead person. Amen. A dead person is not going to be manifesting themselves as darkness. That's right. No. The Word of God teaches us that these type of manifestations are evil and wicked. Now, I'm going to try to start tonight on this, and this will be the end of this, but I think we're going to have to finish next week. From our website, I offered a number of points, and I asked, consider this, consider this thought, consider this uh, 
at a logical, reasonable level. And then we look at what the Word of God says concerning it. Number one, why do ghosts, which so many claim are human spirits, why do they wear clothing, jewelry, shoes, etc.? Do these items also have a spirit or energy that traveled with us into the spirit world? See, the Egyptians used to load up the tombs of the pharaohs with all kinds yeah. of goods for right. them to take into the spirit world. Yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, 3,000 years later, when they dig up the tomb, all that stuff's still there. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. So apparently the pharaoh left without it. Why do spirits often appear with props, tackle, animals, and other items which help to identify them as being from a certain era, period, time, or experience? In other words, World War II, the Civil War, World War I, what have you. The Nazi Party, whatever. Why do they appear with all these uniforms and props? And all? You know, it amazes me. I've, I've said this before. Uh, a guy appears at this prison. Oh, he's a, he's a prison guard who was murdered at this prison. Why in the world, if I'm a spirit and I'm dead, why would I want to hang out at the prison I was murdered in? Wouldn't I maybe want to hang out at my house and watch my kids grow up and, yeah. you know, and see how things go with my children and my grandchildren since I'm not going to be there in life, you know? But, well, no, brother, see, it, it's, the, it's the trauma of the experience. They, they become captured in this place. Yeah, and where, where do you get that from? Amen. Yes, amen. Where, what authority do you have? Mm -hmm. Where in the world do you get this notion from? And why in the world is it that of all the outfits this guy wore in his lifetime, he goes into eternity with his prison uniform on. Yeah. And they have people who die at home, or they have people who die. And, oh, but he worked at this hospital. So old Dr. So-and-so shows up at the hospital in his whites. Mm -hmm. Really? You mean Dr. So-and-so never wore anything else but whites? Yeah. <laughs> why in the world? I mean, if you just think about it logically for a minute, why is that? It, it, what sense does that make? Even if you love the hospital so much you want to spend eternity there. He might have chosen to wear a polo shirt and pants and, you know, jeans and flip-flops. Why must he be in his house? Because it's all about props. It's all about establishing an identity. Okay, if you look at it like a stage and they're using the clothing, they're using all of these things as props. When they have animals with them, when they have guns, when they have this, when they have that, when they're wearing certain types of uniforms from certain eras, it's all about establishing an identity. But the Bible said, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 1.21 1 Timothy 6 and 7, Paul builds on what is said in Job, and he said, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Amen. So right there, we just answered what I'm, the question I'm asking. How come these ghosts, so-called, have all these props and all these outfits and all this stuff from their life. When the Word of God said, it is certain. So Paul's saying, this is absolute. This is a fact. We can carry nothing out. Can't even be done. It can't even be done. Now, the truth then is this. Spirits, demons, appear in full wardrobe so as to represent someone from a specific time period or era. Without the clothing, it would be nearly impossible to represent themselves as anyone in particular. 
As the old saying goes, quote, clothing makes the man. Just like putting on a play, props and wardrobe are essential to the character being portrayed. Many people claim to hear noises which are directly associated with certain types of shoes. Footsteps, walking, dragging, etc. But how is that possible? Do shoes also have a spiritual existence? Why would a human spirit run around in a work-related costume, uniform, or gear? What if they weren't buried in those things? So see, there's not even, there's no continuity anywhere. Some people say, oh, this spirit appeared in the outfit they were buried in. I knew it was my grandmother because she was, she was wearing the dress we buried her. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. And yet there are other spirits, brother, that show up and they're wearing the outfit they used to wear to work every day. There's no continuity. So that means they must go into eternity with a wardrobe. <laughs> or they have some kind of mystical, magical powers, according to Amy Allen, and they can represent themselves in various... So we've got paper dolls here who you can just, you know, fold the little tabs and put all different kind of outfits on. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. And it's all outfits that they owned in this life. It's all things they had in this life. But the Apostle Paul said it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Okay? You will notice that psychics and mediums often refer to what they claim a spirit is wearing in order to... Uh, in an effort to help identify or qualify the spirit they claim to be seeing. You watch these psychics. Every single time, how do they identify to this person the spirit they're seeing? I'm seeing an older woman. And now, the way my grandmother appeared to me in the dream, if they had described her to me that way, I wouldn't have thought it was my grandma Picanso. Well, it looks like a woman about, maybe in her 50s, maybe about 50. Do you follow what I'm saying? My yeah. grandmother was 80, 89 years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when I saw her in the dream, she looked maybe 50. So if, if Amy Allen had said to me, I see a woman about 50, do you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But no, every time these spirits are putting on a show. They're all made up. They're all, their, their little identity is perfectly put together so that they can clearly be identified as mm -hmm. whoever it is yeah. Yeah. that you're wanting or, or claiming is trying to communicate with you. Okay, uh, but rather than, uh, rather than describing the person per se, they often describe the outfit, uniform, uh, that the deceased was not buried with, and how do they attain such a wardrobe in the afterlife? Number two, how can a spirit inflict physical damage or injury to anyone in the natural world? If it's a ghost, if it's a human being uh -huh. that has died, how can they inflict Damage. How can they inflict injury to anyone in the natural world? The Word of God said, listen, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is myself. This is the Lord after the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Luke 24, 39. There is no structure. There is no substance to a spirit. How does a spirit pick this up if it has no structure, no substance? That's right. How does the spirit scratch somebody if it has no bones, no flesh? Right. That's right. How do you do that? Folks, you're not dealing with a ghost. Amen. You're dealing with an entity, a demon, which we, early in our study, we learned have had the power from the beginning to manifest themselves in the natural world. Mm -hmm. And they're able to manifest themselves in a human form as well as in a uh, grotesque or demonic form. Okay? So the truth is, many people report having been bitten or scratched by spiritual entities. Well, now a spirit, according to Jesus, does not have flesh and bones. Well, teeth, that's bone. 
How do you get bitten by something that don't have bones? They also claim to hear noises that are directly associated with a natural flesh and blood existence, such as sneezing, crying, moaning, screaming. A spirit would not have flesh or bone. How then is it, impo how then is it possible to inflict bites or scratches? Why would a spirit who cannot be sick or ill cough or sneeze or puke or break wind or any of those things. If you're not a natural being, if you're not, if you don't have flesh, it is impossible to be affected by a virus. It is impossible to be affected by a bacteria. You can't be sick. You can't have the flu. You can't have pneumonia. You can't have TB. So why would a dead person, if it's their spirit, which is now free from the natural body, why is it coughing? Why is it? And then you got Zach Baggins. Oh, well, you know, all these people died with tuberculosis and we heard coughing. And uh, How is that? Think, Zach. Think for one second. How is it possible? If a spirit has no flesh or bone, how is it possible that they would cough, sneeze, scream, speak? Amen. These things all require a natural process. They require a voice box. You know, they require. How does this happen? Okay. A demonic spirit is an entity with a very real physical presence. Although it is not physical in our natural sense of the word, when a demonic spirit is present, people can often feel their presence as they do genuinely have a physical presence. Albeit, it is more like invisible steam or the wind. They do, however, affect their environment in some way. That's why people say, I was in this room, all of a sudden, I could just tell somebody was in that room with me. Mm -hmm. And I turned around and there was nobody there, but I could feel there was somebody in the room. Mm -hmm. Well, when a physical, natural human being walks into the room, mm -hmm. you may not see them. You may not even hear their footsteps. You may not hear, and yet the environment is affected in some small way. Mm -hmm. God created us as human beings. There, there are aspects to us that we're not even aware of. That's right. There are aspects to us that science hadn't even really tapped into yet. Human being can come in the room and we haven't heard them walk in, we have, and yet we have a sense somebody else is in the room. And you'll turn around and say, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. I had a feeling somebody was in here. Have you ever had that happen? Mm -hmm. I had a feeling somebody was in here. Well, demons, have they affect their environment in the same exact way. Even though they are invisible, they are not without some form of substance. There's actually a substance to them. That's their spiritual manifestation is not... I'm trying, I'm trying to think how to say this. If you look at Transformers, I'll, I'll use a modern day example of something. Look at the movie Transformers. You get a robot from outer space that is able to ching chunk 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 ching chunk ching chunk and change, transform itself into another uh, object, you know, another item, and yet it is using the substance that it already has in order to transform into something different. Mm -hmm. Demons have substance. That is why they are able to manifest themselves in the natural world. Mm -hmm. They are not without substance. There is something substantive about a demon spirit. Mm -hmm. God created them in that way. Same thing with angels. Yeah, that's why that's right. angels are able to manifest themselves in the natural world. They have substance. This is why the Word of God says, and I'm going to close with this tonight, and we'll move into, we'll start next week with number three and finish, okay? This is why... The Word of God said, now, now you'll find this interesting because you never would have thought to put these together. Now faith uh -huh. is the substance 
of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Faith is substantive. Somehow, in a spiritual sense, faith is substantive. It may be the size of an atom. And yet it's able to ching, 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 ching. <laughs> and become a giant. Yeah. Or become a shield. Yes. Or become yeah. a sword. Or become a mountain. Or become a buttress. Or become a tower. Wow. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. God started this world. He created this world by first creating substance. Mm -hmm. Then he took that substance and he transformed it. Mm -hmm. Man was created from what? The dust of the earth. Yes. And he took that dust and he transformed it. Yes, amen. He in effect, if you look at human beings and us dying and, and how we go back to dust, mm -hmm. it would be like reverse engineering back starting with the dead and somehow putting it all together and bringing it back to life. But that was creation. Mm -hmm. He started with the dust. Mm -hmm. He started with what was left when it's all over, when it's all disintegrated, even the bone, nothing's mm -hmm. left. And he then formed something out of, he didn't form something out of nothing. That's right. His very word is substantive. Yes, that's right. That's why when God speaks, things happen. Mm -hmm. Why? Is God starting with nothing? No, He's starting with something. Mm -hmm. You see, we live in the flesh, and we cannot understand these high spiritual concepts. How in the world can words be substantive? And the Word became flesh. Yes, amen. Transformed. It changed nature. It started out as this, and all of a sudden, boop, 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 it became something different. Are you following the principle of what I'm talking about? Yes. Demons, folks, have that substantive nature. That is why even in their invisible state, you can sense them. You can feel them. You don't have to have the Holy Ghost. You don't have to have... Um, you don't have to have the Spirit of God in your life. You don't have to have discernment of spirits. A lot of times, even people in their homes, when they're being vexed and when they're being so-called haunted and in reality they're being oppressed or they're being vexed, uh, this is why a lot of times, as I say, people will say, I feel, I, I feel constantly like I'm being watched. I feel, you know, I, I always feel like there's somebody there. What's making you feel that way? Mm -hmm. Scientists would say, oh, well, you know, you're just paranoid. You just, you just somehow got it in your head that there's somebody there. But, but no, you, you're getting that same, uh, I'm going to use this term for lack of a better, you're getting that same uh, static witness that you get when somebody enters the room and you didn't hear them come in, and you, but you had a sense they were there. Mm -hmm. It's almost like our bodies pick up on even the slightest movement of air. Mm -hmm. See, science tells us, brother, that we have hair on our arms. and See, they've given us explanations for all that. Oh, that's there because, you know, it used to be yeah. when we were apes. That that's what kept us warm. But we evolved. Somehow or another we decided we didn't need to stay warm anymore. <laughs> and our bodies went bald. I can't wait till we get to heaven and God just laughs with us. Yes, amen. I really can't. I, I, I've thought about this many times. I thought about, I can't wait until the Lord shows us a film yeah. about why he created things the way he created them. And, say, and then say, now scientists said that this was... <laughs> It evolved into this because of this. How can they prove that that's what happened? How can they prove that it evolved 
from this to this for this reason. You, you, it's all speculation. Well, say amen. It's all speculation. You cannot prove for one bloody minute that a black man's hair became kinky because in Africa it's so hot that, that it, it just evolved that way to help keep their head cool. That's what they say. Say, really? It's funny it didn't evolve white because black absorbs heat. Yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yet, it is natural for black people, people with dark skin, to have dark hair. Mm -hmm. Isn't it funny that evolution is so stupid it doesn't know that? Isn't it funny it evolves in one way to diffuse the heat and to keep their head cool? Do you follow what I'm saying? It's all speculation, folks. Right, of course. And, and I think to myself sometimes, I just can't wait till the Lord shows us the reality behind some yes, things. Amen. And said, now here's what they were saying. They were saying thus and so, but this is why I did this. This is why this had this. Mm -hmm. Evolution put these false eyes on these fish, brother. Oh, Lord. So that the predators would think that the fish was facing them. That's why they have these false eyes on the back of their bodies. Can't wait the Lord said, false eyes? There were no false eyes. No false, there were no false eye. I put that there. And he gives us a reason for why he put... What, you, do you know what I'm saying? All right, amen. So, uh, but demonic spirits absolutely are substantive. And I'm telling you, we're going to get to heaven. That's the point I was trying to make, and then I'm going to shut up. We're going to get to heaven, and the Lord's going to say, No, you know why you have those little hairs on your body? I put them there because they are just like the little hairs on certain animals and on yeah. certain bugs and on certain things. They literally help you to know when something else is in your environment. Mm -hmm. That's an early warning system for you. When you're in an enclosed space, now if you're outside and you know you're in the wind and in the breeze, you're not going to have the same uh, experience. But if you're in an enclosed space and somebody walks into that space, even if you don't hear them, even if you don't see them, mm -hmm. little hairs on your body feel that little bit of movement. They sense that little bit of atmospheric change. And all of a sudden you're getting a sensation. Oh, there's somebody else here. You follow what I'm saying? Yep. Wouldn't it be funny when we get to heaven and find out that's really why we got hair on our arms? <laughs> I can't wait to hear God's explanation for the underarm hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Don't say anything else. <laughs> All right, amen. Would you stand with me tonight? <laughs> amen. Anyway, is this informative anyway? Are you getting anything out of this? So from a biblical standpoint, thus far, we cannot find any support for ghosts. But we can find plenty of support for the concept of demonic spirits manifesting themselves. Like I said, I'm going to repeat real fast. What is the primary reason that demons do this? It's deceit. But what, what is in that deceit? What are they trying to convince you of? Take away the oh, that the Bible's not true. That's right. That the Bible's not true. They're trying to make you question the Word of God. Mm -hmm. What did Satan do in the garden with Eve? That's right. God. Question God. Tried to get Eve to question God. That's right. Has God said? Mm -hmm. Well, is that really what he meant? Yeah. It's more or less what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is what the devil is doing. Every time somebody thinks they're seeing a ghost... Tommy and I watch these programs and these people will turn around and say, I believe in the afterlife now. I believe that after death there is more. Yeah, but you know what? They don't believe in God. They don't believe in heaven. They don't believe in hell. Uh, this experience hasn't convinced them of the need for the cross. It's just convinced them that after they die, they might wind up floating around their house for a few million years. You see? It makes you question the Word of God. All these scriptures that I'm pointing out about, you know, it's certain we take nothing with us when we leave. All these things are called into question by these so-called experiences That's right. that people are having. Satan wants you to question the Word of God. Amen. All right.